So Blaine, you can start. Okay. Um, apologies if I'm a little low energy today. It is unusual for me to be low energy. So please forgive me in advance. Can everybody hear me okay? If you yes. can, can you put your, oh, thank you so much. Man, it's so cool to see so many people and you all came in at the same time. So the Soviet, post-Soviet rules are really working. Uh, I would just, um, I would just change something Julie said just slightly, only for when I'm teaching. The difference is she said the texts are hard and the lectures are to understand. I think for my classes, it's going to be quite the opposite, <laughs> um, and which is a bit of an anomaly. So, um, you know, my lectures, particularly today's, I think probably will be quite difficult, but Freud is very easy to read. Uh, and so, you know, get what you can from it. Don't feel like you need to understand everything. I'm really just trying to provoke you uh, because it is, it is going to be perhaps a little bit more um, high level. Also, um, for the first lecture, I, I think I have more notes than I can fit into this time. So if it overflows, maybe if, if Julie is amenable with it, um, I could finish anything I need to finish in the seminar on Friday. Uh, before uh, moving on to something. I'm not sure if I'm doing the seminars or if we both, if, if, it's, if it's me, I hope we can talk about our dreams a little bit to one another as well. Julie? Yeah, we can do whatever. Okay, okay, good, good. Okay. So I thought we'd open up the course um, with some basic positions put forward by Sigmund Freud. Uh, don't be fooled, I said basic, but I'm gonna make them a bit more uh, difficult. Again, I apologize in advance. Uh, from his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, which was published uh, 1899. They write that it was published 1900 because uh, it, it makes it seem like it was uh, marking the turn of the century. More specifically, we're going to look at chapters, I think, six and seven. Uh, one is on the dream work and the other is on the psychology of uh, the dream processes, which sounds very technical. Um, so that's what I'm going to try and focus on, but uh, I wanted to begin with a question and it's a rhetorical question, which means I'm not expecting you to answer, but if you wanna try and answer in your own mind, uh, please go ahead. The question is, uh, when do you dream? When do you dream? Yeah, I find it's a really difficult question for me to answer. That's why I'm asking it here because I can't answer it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so I feel somewhat justified asking the question to all of you because I can't answer it. So hopefully we could work towards some sort of an answer. Uh, so it's a question concerning the time of dreaming. You know, we, can, we, we might rephrase the question. Um, is the dream a discrete phenomena? Discrete meaning can it be isolated as such from other phenomena such that we can say we're, you know, we're like, we're either dreaming or else we're, uh, 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 or else we're awake, uh, you know, or, or can we think about it in a more continuous way? Like uh, dreaming is somewhere even at the nexus of the two, you know, somewhere when we're sleeping and we're waking and, and we're awake. This is what I wanted to explore today. So for the, fa for the sake of simplicity, we can, I think, plot uh, three, the, the three sort of times of dreaming as we typically understand them. Uh, I don't know if I can share screen. Yes, okay. So typically, we think of dreaming in terms of three, let's say, states. We're sleeping, we wake up, and then we are in waking life, something like that. I would consider this to be something like a naive sort of classification for the for the time of dreaming. And typically we would presume, wouldn't we, I think, that dreaming occurs during the time of sleep. This is, I think, what most of us would uh, presume. Forgive me while I try and figure out how to stop sharing. Uh, oh, here it is, okay. So we're typically, we typically claim that dreams occur during the time of sleeping. But then it makes me ask another question. When does the dream end? You know, does, it, does the dream reach a conclusion before we wake up? Does the dream conclude at the precise moment that we wake up? You know, and then we have the, the further complication that we know that sometimes we have multiple dreams in a single night. 
um, during the period of sleeping. We're, we're, we're in the sleeping state and we have more than one dream. Here, Freud insisted that we should treat those multiple dreams as if they were the same dream. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to presume that there's only one dream. I'm not going to presume there's multiple dreams. So this is how I think most of us think about dreaming today. First, we, we imagine that dreams occur only during the sleeping state when we're sleeping, right? Second, we believe that they conclude in some way, either before we wake up or at the moment of waking up. And third, we tend to presume that there are these sort of discrete or distinct moments of dreaming, each delimiting a sort of particular uh, relationship to the time of dreaming. You know, we're sleeping, we wake up, and then we're in waking life, these sort of discrete uh, stages. Um, this logic presumes something, doesn't it? Um, I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see this whiteboard. I'm gonna kind of roll it in. Can you see it? Can you read it? Yes. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So I won't use it that much. I'll just use it now then. Um, what it presumes when we have this model, it presumes that you can only, um, um, you can only go to time three by passing through time two. You know, you can't go directly from sleep to waking life you have to pass through a time for waking up. So you, it means you can't go to time three directly. There's always an intermediary of time two, which is the time of waking up, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's something discrete that, that separates the time of sleeping when we suppose we dream from the time of waking up. So you can't sleep in waking life when we think like this. There's no understanding of sleeping in waking life. My conviction, and it's one that I hope to explore a little bit with you today and maybe throughout this course, is that it is possible to dream during the waking state when we're awake, during the time of waking life. It implies that uh, time one, the sleeping state, can be a space of dreaming, yes, but time three, the waking state when we're awake, can also be a space for dreaming. You know, and it occurs to me, I don't know how, if you've taken any courses yet from others on Marxism, but it occurs to me that this is what in the Marxist tradition, they call ideology. Ideology is dreaming in waking life. It's, it's exactly what um, one thinker, namely, uh, if you don't know the name, it's okay, you will hear it at some point, Althusser, Althusser, uh, uh, a Marxist who thought he was very true to the Marxist dogma, he claimed that ideology is precisely this. Ideology demonstrates that we dream when we are awake. That was Althusser's point. He wrote this in his famous essay, um, Ideological State Apparatuses. And he wrote it on more than one occasion. I'm quoting him, in fact. I have the quote here in my scribbles. Ideology is for Karl Marx a pure dream. Exact quote from Althusser. But we can also look at the Eastern spiritual systems. Here in Russia, we're not exactly considered Eastern, uh, but we're also not West. You know? So when I say Eastern spiritual system, I mean like Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on, where there is this conviction, um, and this conviction has some footing among most people in the, uh, within the religion. There's even a, a fairly uh, contemporary, they call them neo-sannyasins, which is a sort of new form of Buddhism, um, a neo-sannyasin spiritual leader, Julie knows who he is, his name's Osho, who's claimed that Zen, you know, Zen in Zen Buddhism, Zen is nothing but an alarm clock. Zen is an alarm clock. Um, and we all know that the function of an alarm clock is to wake us up. In Zen, the alarm clock is a device to wake us up from the dreams that you have during waking life, to wake us up from ideology. So in this case, the assumption is that the time of dreaming is not exactly discrete. You can't say dreaming only happens when we're asleep in our earlier sort of naive classification system that we use when we talk to our friends and so on. That's ideology. You know, it would seem that dream is a continuous phenomenon. There's some continuity to the dream across the sleeping and the waking states. So we could say, for example, um, again, I'm not sure you can see this, but let me try. Can you read it? If not, I can use whiteboard on Zoom. 
Yeah, okay. You could say that the dream cuts across these three stages in some way. I'm not sure how yet, but in some way. So the dream is continuous in this sort of um, schema. The dream moves from waking, from sleeping into waking life in some way. You can imagine maybe that it's like a circle. We sleep, we wake up, but the dream continues. It's, so it's a continuous phenomena rather than a discrete phenomena. In fact, what's interesting though, is that neither Freud nor Jacques Lacan, whose name you're gonna hear a lot of from me, they didn't abandon the usage of these sleeping states in their discussions of dreams. Freud used the word sleeping, waking up, awake, or waking life. Lacan used uh, uh, these sleeping state, uh, these various states. He said, we're sleeping, we're awake, uh, we wake up, and so on. They didn't abandon these discrete terms, which is interesting to me. It would seem as though Freud used these terms, sleep, waking up, waking life, in a fairly uh, naive way, in a more naive way than Lacan. But Lacan began to question these discrete states more openly. He literally asked, what does it mean not to dream, but to wake up? What does it mean to wake up? That's where the real enigma is for Lacan. Um, so it's for this reason that I think we should preserve these states, sleeping, waking up, waking life, why not? We might even add a fourth, falling asleep, which is another transitory experience. Uh, so I want to preserve these states. I think they do tell us something important, these discrete states. Well, nonetheless, admitting that there's something of the continuity to dreaming, right? So you can dream in any one of these states in some fashion, but there, we nonetheless will retain the states. We can have the dream as a continuous phenomena that occurs across the states of sleeping, waking, and waking up. Um, and we, we might want to add falling asleep. Uh, so it seems to me that this is exactly what Jacques Lacan did. I know some of you probably not familiar with Lacan, his last name spelled L-A-C-A-N. This is exactly what he did. He said it quite literally. What he said was, we wake up, it's a discrete state, we wake up, to continue dreaming, the continuity of the dream. We wake up to continue dreaming. Um, th this is also something that Islamic mystics knew for a very long time. You don't hear it a lot in uh, Christian mysticism, but in Islamic mysticism. In any case, in this statement, you can see that there's a continuity of the dream alongside the transition into a new discrete state, waking life, right? So the way that you might want to imagine it, and this is where things are gonna get truly complicated for you, so please forgive me. If you want, you can imagine that these states are different positions from which we can relate to the dreams that we have. These discrete states are different positions from which we can relate to the dream. This is why I insist upon making, um, let's say a further adjustment to the simple schema that we've been working with. Uh, to demonstrate the continuity of the dream while retaining the discrete positions or states from which we experience the dream. So maybe we'll have it like this. I really hope you can see this in some way. So let's say we have sleep, waking up, waking life, or being awake. Um, you, you can go through them, yes. But then when you wake up, you're still kind of, you're still kind of, um, you're still kind of uh, sleeping because you're, you're dreaming. So you're sleeping while you're awake in a certain sense. So the way that I kind of imagine it is as like a circle or a square, there's a continuity to it. So these arrows represent the continuity of the dream. And each one of these is the discrete stages or states that we can be in. I want to draw it a little different, but I don't want to confuse you even more. Um, so what it demonstrates is that there is continuity. And the way to imagine this continuity is through a figure known as the Mobius strip. I don't know if you're familiar with the Mobius strip. You take a rectangle. So here we've made a rectangle. And you take one side and you twist it 180 degrees and reattach it. And when you do that, you produce a continuous surface. 
Um, you might want to try it at home if you have a sheet of paper, a rectangular sheet of paper when you get out of this class, if you have free time, and I doubt any of you do. Um, but you, a Mobius strip produces a continuous surface that folds in upon itself. It has only one side, a Mobius strip, and yet nonetheless, there are positions upon which you can be situated at a given time. So imagine you have a Mobius strip, which kind of, if I were to draw it, it kind of looks like this. You know, it, it's like twisting in upon itself. Um, imagine there's an ant walking along this Mobius strip. If it can keep walking forever because it's a continuous surface, but at any given time, there is an opposite side to the, to the sheet of paper or the rectangle. So it's walking continuously in circles. There is continuity. But at any given time, it's positioned in such a way that there is an opposite side, a versa. So there's something discrete about the ant's experience in relation to the continuity of the Mobius strip. It can say, right now I'm on the top side, so I'm awake. Now, on the other side, it would be sleeping. If I keep walking, I'll be on the sleeping side, but on the opposite side, I would be awake. That's a Mobius strip. It's a continuous surface that always has these discrete states, but it's continuous at the same time. That's precisely what I'm claiming about the dream. So waking up then is a twist. It's um, what fancy cool philosophers today call a torsion. It's when you take the, the sheet of paper and you twist it. It's there where the, where the sheet of paper twists into its opposite side, that's waking up. You could say maybe that's falling asleep as well. That's where the, the one side of the, of the rectangle meets its opposing side. Wake, uh, sleeping meets waking up, for example, or waking life. And waking up would be that twist. Um, so this is the, the comp fairly complex, I understand, uh, but preliminary schema that I wanna use to guide our thinking for this half of the course. If you don't fully, if you can't fully uh, twist your head around this idea, um, it, it's totally okay. Just let it kind of move around in your head and maybe at some point it'll start to make sense. Um, it doesn't yet tell us anything about Freud's conception of the dream. It doesn't inform us about Jacques Lacan's notion of the dream or of his question regarding what it means to wake up. So really we still have this sub-question. You know, and the sub-question that I wanna ask is what, what are the differences of Freud and Lacan on the question of the time of the dream. Speaking of time, when we get close to the end, could somebody please let me know? That would be really cool. Just by um, making a sound because I can't see everybody right now. So the twisting of the dream during the transition of sleep and waking life, I think can often be barely uh, discernible in actuality. This is why the question of the time of the dream is so difficult for me and perhaps for all of us. So we have a, the set of questions still. Do we actually know when we wake up? Uh, I was thinking about how doubt and certainty have their place in relation to waking up. For example, sometimes we'll say um, in waking life, am I dreaming? It feels too good to be true. Am I dreaming? You doubt whether you're awake. There's a doubt there. It's a statement of doubt. Um, I know that children, at least when I was a kid, people used to say this. I don't know if they still say it, but they, would, they invented a way to test their reality if they were really in waking life by pinching themselves. This idea, it's an expression of doubt. They're not sure they're really awake. I would say that today, we're not really having this problem, are we? Increasingly, there are those who don't doubt whether they're dreaming. They're certain that they're awake. We call them the woke. They're woke. Uh, which means that they know that they're awake. Well, there's others out there that are sleeping. <laughs> uh, so we could be sleeping, but we believe ourselves to be awake. And it happens a lot. Uh, you know, real, very often when we're sleeping, we don't even know that we are sleeping. I mean, it's not always the case. People talk about lucid dreams, but it, it occurs frequently enough for us to formulate an argument that the dream insulates you from its um, let's call it its governing frame. You know, you're isolated from any knowledge concerning the framework of the dream. May, I'll put it more simple. You dream on the condition that you don't know that you're dreaming. 
you know, when you're dreaming, you, you don't know you're dreaming typically. <laughs> you know, you're kind of trapped in there. You don't know you're dreaming. Um, sometimes we even wake up within a dream and we believe ourselves to be awake while we're still dreaming. These are twists and torsions. In reality, we're still sleeping, but we woke up in the dream. Um, there's one psychoanalyst, his name is Jacques Alain Miller, M I L L E R, a contemporary psychoanalyst. He claimed that when we wake up inside of a dream while we're still in the sleeping state, that's actually the dream's last recourse to sustain the space of dreaming. We dream to wake up so that we don't actually wake up. It's, it's a crazy idea. We dream to wake up as a last recourse to keep ourselves from waking up so that we can stay sleeping. This is the, the difficulty of the dream. Um, Lacan, I would say, advanced beyond Freud. Lacan, L-A-C-A-N, advanced beyond Freud uh, by showing us that we are most asleep when we are in the waking state. He said, I, I repeat it again, we wake up to continue dreaming. This is already a departure from Freud and perhaps the Freud that you've read or you're going to read for this class or skim for this class. You know, Lacan said, we wake up to, con to continue dreaming in the waking state. And that's quite different from sleeping in order to avoid waking up, which was Freud's em emphasis. Freud said, we sleep so that we don't have to wake up. Lacan said, um, we wake up in order to continue dreaming. They're not the same positions. And I know it's hard to wrap your head around it. And I understand some of you are probably extremely confused right now. You're not alone. There's a lot of you that are confused and I share your confusion. Um, and that's perfectly okay. For Freud, we don't want to exit the sleeping state. This is his claim. Fundamentally, we want to keep on dreaming. The dream operates to sustain itself so that we don't have to wake up. This is Freud's position. We want to preserve the space of dreaming, to suspend the frame of the dream so that we can remain within the comforts of our dream world in the sleeping state while we're snoring. That's Freud. Lacan, things are different. For Lacan, it's the woke who don't want to admit that they're sleeping. The woke don't want to admit that they're having dreams in waking life. It's a really important difference. Um, it's also a difference that we find in scripture. Uh, compare, for example, the Christian tradition with the Islamic tradition, just as an example. I'm not sure if you know about um, all of this, but I'll, I'll let you know what you need to know. There's one scholar who I was in touch with not so long ago, who, uh, whose entire work is about the, the, the function of caves in Christian scripture. Why are there caves, so many caves in the Bible? And they fa she found that it's always a space of concealment, of imprisonment. It's a space from which um, the main character in the story, in the Bible, should try to escape. It's not the case in Islam. Um, caves take on a different function in Islamic scripture. The most obvious example comes from, uh, a, it's called a surah. It's like a chapter in the Quran. A surah called the cave. Within this surah called the cave, there's a line that I think is really important. I'm quoting it. This is the English translation. You might have thought them awake, though they were sleeping. End quote. It's a really interesting narrative and a, and a nice counterpoint to the Christian conception of the cave. Um, look, many scholars note the structural correspondence of caves in the Christian tradition with Plato's cave. You know about Plato's cave? If you do, could you just give me a thumbs up? No? Plato? No? I think you're going to learn about Plato in a course this week, actually, some of you. So you'll learn. Basically, what's going on, it's okay that you don't know it. Um, Plato, the philosopher. Um, the cave is in both cases, whether in Plato's version of the cave, which you'll learn about in another class, I, hopefully, and Christian tradition. Both of, in both cases, the cave is a prison which you're trying to escape from. You're basically dreaming in the cave. You see figures. You're seeing shadows projected onto the walls. 
So these walls are obstacles from your freedom outside, outside the cave. Outside, there's no walls. There's no image figures that are concealing reality. So what happens in the narrative of Plato's cave is, to put it simply, one person leaves the cave, which means he wakes up from the dream world. He's not seeing all these obscure figures anymore projected onto the walls. Well, what happens in the Quran is really different. In the Quran, in the surah on the cave, we begin not with people imprisoned in their cave, but uh, with individuals that are outside of the cave. They're already woke. We begin with the woke, not the dreamers, as in the Christian tradition. Everybody's awake. They're un, they're, they're, they've got freedom. They're in the pagan world, in a permissive society that allows them to do anything they want. They can worship any god they want. Uh, and they find it unbearable. This is what it says in the surah on the cave. So they go in search of a cave. They don't have a cave. They go in search of one. You know, in the Christian tradition, in Plato's cave, you're trying to break free from the ideology of the cave, from the dreaming that goes on in the cave. In Islam, in the Quran, uh, they're trying to break free from freedom. They're trying to find their own cave, their own prisons. So for no other reason than because they want to sleep. They want to sleep. And to do that, they have to find a cave and, and they're able to sleep. And they sleep for many, many years, in fact. I think hundreds of years, if I remember it correctly. So there's a difference between those who sleep in the Bible and those who sleep in the Quran. For Plato uh, and the Christians, the cave is a space where you doubt your reality. You're dreaming, but you don't know you're dreaming. And then you wake up and the challenge is to convince yourself and other people of the reality, the freedom that you saw outside of the cave. You need to wake up. Um, it's like uh, Jesus exiting the cave after which there's a resurrection, which is a sort of awakening. There's an awakening. He exits the cave and now he's woke. Um, and then there are those who doubt the resurrection. And, you know, in the Bible, it says they have eyes so that they cannot see. Well, Freud was doing something similar. He, I would say he was busying himself looking at the shadows that were projected onto the walls of his clinic. Freud, the psychoanalyst, he was trying to wake people up. It's funny we're talking about waking people up because I think probably many of us feel like we're half asleep right now. <laughs> I would love to wake up. Um, Freud was against the people who doubted, uh, up, he was up against the people who were doubting their realities. He, his patients, they were having dreams. His patients were dreaming. And then they went to their analyst to wake up to the truth of those dreams. The Islamic surah is different. I, I hope some of you will take the time to read it. The cave is the name of the surah, because it's really brilliant. I mean, read it as a scholar. I'm asking you to read it as a scholar. Um, basically, you have a woke mob. You have those who are already awake. They're not looking at projections on the wall of a cave. There are no walls at all because they're outside. They're in the city. They're in a permissive city of enjoyments and freedoms. It's a neoliberal city. It's a postmodern city. It's a city of shopping malls. And the Quran even says something about the shopping mall. The, the prohibitions, which says, no, you can't do this or that, it's lacking in this world. It's a permissive world. They're free to worship any god they want or not at all. They could be an atheist if they wish. And this constitutes the pain of their freedom. So we're told that they sought refuge in the cave and they woke up precisely inside of their dream, which is different from sleeping and waking life. That's the difficulty of the Mobius trip. Sleeping and waking life is different from being awake in the dream world. So um, today we're told, and lots of scholars have been confirming this, particularly in the time of COVID, that in, we have clinical and scholarly reports that increasingly we have an inability to dream. Uh, many people are claiming they don't dream anymore. At the same time, there's a prevalence of nightmares. Uh, people are having more nightmares than ever. Look up the COVID uh, dream project, for example, which is an international study on the nightmares that people are having during COVID. 
People are not dreaming in the sleeping state, or if they are, they're having nightmares instead. They're dreaming in reality, but they're not dreaming in the sleeping state. They're having more nightmares. I don't know if you're included here. You might wanna ask yourself, and maybe during the seminar, we'll talk about it more, um, whether you are dreaming. When I was a kid, I used to dream a lot. So let's return to uh, our thread because I went on a major tangent. Uh, so it's, it's clear from the schema that I drew that the dream never ends, that we wake up to continue uh, dreaming in waking life. So in a sense, we're always dreaming, but it doesn't seem as though this was Freud's conception of the dream. So let's focus for a little bit on Freud's text. Um, in chapter seven of the interpretation of dreams, Freud shared a father's dream. It was a dream of a father, not his father, but a father. This father saw his dead son speaking to him beside his bed in the dream. So what happened? Uh, if, if you read the text, then you can just skim it for the points that I kind of highlight here. You don't have to actually read the whole text. You're just looking in the text for confirmation of what this ego in front of you is saying right now. Okay, so you're like, I'm, I'm the highlighter for your text. Okay, so you're, you're really just skimming the text when you're reading it. Um, so the father is sleeping. He's in the state of sleep. He's sleeping in reality beside a room in which his dead son uh, is resting. His son is in a coffin. And there's a light shining from the room into the room that the father's sleeping. It's flickering. And in reality, this light is shining because a candle fell onto the boy's, the dead boy's arm, lighting him on fire. This really happened. So the fire is flickering and it's casting all these strange lights into the room that, ha that has the, the father who's sleeping. That's what's happening in reality. Okay, so if a fire started on your dead boy in a coffin, I think that would be quite frightening. It would wake you up, right? That's the sort of thing that would wake you up. I, you know, some, I remember the first time my son had a nosebleed, he was screaming um, for me and that definitely woke me up. It woke me up in a shock. That would constitute a genuine awakening. It's one way to truly be woke. But instead, what did the father do? Freud tells us that the father incorporated something of this awakening, something of this reality of this awakening into his dream. He, he was dreaming instead that his boy was alive and saying, Father, don't you see that I'm burning? That's what the dream was. It's called the Father, don't you see that I'm burning dream for Freud. So what you should notice is that the father, instead of waking up into reality to get rid of the flame, uh, the fire on his dead boy's arm, he takes something of that reality and uses it to preserve the space of dreaming, to preserve the dream work, to allow the dream to continue. You know, um, maybe to make this a little easier, I'll show you what I mean. Again, if you can't see this, let me know. So let's say you have the space of dreaming, which is this circle. Yeah, and then you have reality, which is a different space out here. And there's like uh, the dead boy who's on fire. I'm just gonna draw this stupid fire thing. And this is the space of dreaming. He incorporates that into the dream world. And now he's got in here, what would you call it? An alive boy who says, father, don't you see that I'm burning? He takes from reality to preserve the space of the dream. It's actually like a really simple conception at once you imagine it like that. So we have a space of dreaming that seeks to preserve itself by incorporating in a distorted form. It's distorting it. It's incorporating something of reality, something of waking life into the dream. The dream kind of swallows reality in this way. You can imagine if you like, and I think Freud imagined it this way, that the dream is like show business. You know what they say in New York? Julie might know. Julie knows this, I think. What they say in New York and in Hollywood, they say the show must go on. And so, you know, we would say, because Hollywood is a bit of a dream world, we would say the dream must go on. This is perhaps even what, what happens in the movie La La Land, uh, if you've seen it. Freud puts it like this. I'm quoting Freud. The father has a desire to sleep 
The father's sleep is prolonged for a moment by the dream. The underlying motive is let the dream go on or else I must wake up. As in this dream, so in all the others, we wish to lend sleep its support to, the, to our unconscious wishes. So you see his point, his basic point, that's the end of the quote, his basic point is that the dreamer, all of us, when we dream, we want to keep dreaming. It's Freud's basic position on the dream. His view is of a world that doesn't want to wake up from the comforts of sleeping. It attempts to remain suspended within the sleep state because that's where the dream happens. It's a world of comfort, a world of pillows. Some of you are lucky you could clutch a pillow while you're listening to this nightmare today. Uh, but It's a world of pillows, um, blankets, and couches, which is precisely what Freud had on his, his couch in his clinic as well. But reality, on the other hand, is not so comfortable because in reality, um, we have obstacles. And so we, Freud revealed that we don't want to wake up into that uncomfortable reality. The dream is our cave of amusements. So we could claim with Freud that we don't want to wake up from our sleeping state because it's a place where all of our wishes come true. This was Freud's position. He, he, he explained that the dream is a space of, he called it wish fulfillment. The dream is a space of wish fulfillment. In waking life, we don't always get what we want. That was Freud's supposition. It's quite different today. But when Freud was alive, the idea was that you can't, you don't always get what you want in waking life. There's even a Rolling Stones song. That's the lyric. You can't always get what you want. And so we get what we want in our dreams. We get what we want in our dreams. Um, so this is where I think I want to because I feel like you might be starting to understand something. I want to confuse you again. I really hope you can see this okay. If not, let me know. I can mail you the diagram. Um, so we said we have these three states, sleep, waking up, and um, waking life or being woke. And we said that, uh, sorry, dreaming, is continuous uh, throughout them. Now I just want to add something else and I'll explain it after. I'm putting the word repression over here. I really hope you can see this okay. The word is repression and up here at the top I'm putting a minus sign and down here at the bottom I'm putting a plus. So if you're drawing this along with me, please do so. And I'll try and explain it as I'm talking. I'll explain what I mean by this repress. Because we've already talked about this left part, right? I'm adding this right part, repression, minus at the top, plus at the bottom, which means more or less. And this arrow, of course, means more or less. OK, so it looks like a complicated diagram. It's actually quite simple. All it says is that according to Freud, there's an obstacle within waking life, within reality. The obstacle is what we call repression. And this obstacle is overcome in some way in our sleeping lives, in our dreams. So all the bits and the fragments of the day, the, the pieces that didn't fit together, that bothered us, were burdens to us, all, those, all these obstacles, they're brought into some consistency within the dream world, within the dream space. It's for this reason that uh, Freud claimed that dreams are, I'm quoting him, the royal road to the unconscious, end quote. Uh, because to some extent, they open up the gates of repression. So uh, these wishes or desires, we have them in waking life. They're there because we can't get what we wish for in waking life, you know, because what is, look, what is desire? Desire is a category of what's missing. You know, you can only desire or wish for something because you don't have it. There's an obstacle to getting it, right? So we desire in waking life, but we get what we desire when we're sleeping, when we're dreaming, sorry, when we're dreaming. So for Freud, reality or waking life is filled with obstacles. I call them prohibitions, things that we, things that we can't get. We're not allowed to get, like maybe a promotion or a degree or a good grade or something. The dream is a space where these prohibitions can be overcome. 
where we can get what we desire in, uh, for what we desire in reality, what we wished for in reality within waking life. So in our dreams, we get what we desire. Okay, for example, some people are able to sleep on hard floors. You know, if you're tired enough from the day, then you can sleep on a hard floor because your unconscious is like a soft pillow. Maybe you're dreaming of a soft pillow. <laughs> you know, this is the idea. So you're, you're dreaming softly upon the hard floor of reality. That would be a wonderful way to put, to summarize what I was just saying. You dream softly upon the hard floor of reality. <laughs> um, the problem, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but the problem is that repression still exists in the dream just as much as it exists in waking life. You know, you have an unconscious whether you're sleeping or not whether you're awake or, or sleeping. Um, I'll give you an example. Lacan once claimed that uh, he heard an alarm clock. I, I wouldn't call it a Zen alarm clock, but an alarm clock. Um, and then he incorporated that alarm clock, that sound from the alarm clock into the dream so that he could keep on sleeping. Maybe it's the sound of like a plane taking off or something like that. Uh, I see a chat. 40, oh, okay, great. Good, good, good. In the future, I'll try not to, um, to do too much lecture mode. Sorry, I'm just trying to learn how to close the chat now. There we go. Okay. So the alarm clock in reality is a wake-up call. I woke up to an alarm clock today. <laughs> it's a wake-up call. It wakes us up to a reality filled with obstacles. If we'd rather avoid that, then we can dream that that alarm clock is the sound of a plane taking off to a dream vacation destination in Italy or something. Um, and so we continue dreaming so that we don't have to wake up. So as not to face reality, we preserve the space of dreams for Freud precisely because of the comforts that it provides us against the reality that prohibits us from getting what we want. Right? Um, the simple way that Freud put this was he said, dreams, you can quote this, dreams are expressions of wish fulfillment. That's how he summarized everything I've just said. We try to preserve the space of dreaming within the dream to avoid waking up into reality because dreaming is a place where we can safely avoid the obstacles, the prohibitions of waking life, of civilization, of SAS of Tumim, of Russia, of the world, whatever. In psychoanalysis, in the clinic, um, quite a few decades ago, we used to talk about our dreams to our analysts. And some people still imagine that we do that. It does still happen in the clinic, but I don't believe that it happens in the same way. We were in a waking state when we talked about our dreams that we had in our sleeping state. Think about that. We're, wait, we're awake when we talk to our analysts, right? We're awake, we're sitting there or we're laying on the couch, clutching a pillow, acting like we're asleep. Um, and, the, and, and we're telling our dreams in waking life, we're speaking about dreaming to our analysts. And somehow we, we gain access to our dreams and the truth of our dreams while we're awake. Um, there's a reason why there's a couch, a fainting couch. It's a fainting couch. Uh, which is essentially a bed inside of the psychoanalytic clinic. Mine for a year had a soft pillow, one soft leather pillow, <laughs> fake leather. Um, and my, many of my patients would hug the pillow while they were speaking about their dreams or whatever else. They would hug the pillow. And in doing so, they could say something about their dreams. Uh, Okay, but how did they discuss their dreams? Well, they did so in waking life using words. That's the obstacle of waking life, using words to discuss your dreams. You have to talk about it. The obstacle of waking life, it was already there in the speech that they had about their dreams. You speak in the clinic, right? You're using words, you're forced to incorporate language. You use grammar to be understood and you want your dreams to be understood by an other, your analyst or whoever you're telling the dream to. 
And with all of these materials of language, speech, grammar, and so on, you explain your dream in waking life to your analyst. And it's, sometimes it's really difficult to do that. The patient will sometimes say, well, I can't explain this part of my dream. Or they'll say, I can't remember or figure out what this part of the dream means. There's no words for it. The patient is expressing an obstacle, which is the obstacle of language, of speaking about the dream within the clinic. In a way, merely discussing the dream in the clinic is a way of removing the pillow from the dream. And perhaps the patient can say even nothing at all, or, or maybe, and it's quite likely as well, the patient speaks for a short moment about the dream. Uh, maybe the dream only lasted a minute, but the interpretation, the patient's interpretation of the dream will last three years. I talked about a dream for 10 years in my analysis. It was one short dream I had. <laughs> a short dream could have a year's discussion. Freud said that a short dream can fill endless pages of material. So the sessions can go by, the clinical sessions one by one even with an excitement on the part of the patient, with an endless discussion of the meanings of the dream. This happens during a contemporary psychoanalysis when the patient demonstrates that there are no obstacles to his speech in reality, and that he can speak endlessly without interruption about all of the meanings that are condensed within his dream space. No obstacles, I can say anything about it. Speech is not an obstacle for me. I'm not sure they're talking language at this point, but. The silence of the dream can meet the verbosity of the clinic. So this is how I would plot that according to my little diagram here. I hope you can see it. Um, let's say we have the silence or the images of the dream and I'll come back to say what that is. Uh, can meet the speech or the language that occurs, let's say, in the clinic. Now, I know this is kind of confusing, but I'm gonna try and explain it again. Uh, what I did was I drew a diagonal here. And at the top left, I wrote silence and images. At the bottom right, I wrote speech or language. And I'm gonna explain what that means in a moment. Please, um, I hope I can offer you a metaphorical pillow. I promise today's lecture is the hardest one. I promise you that. So let's, let's see if you have this in front of you, and I hope some of you have jotted it down. Some of you who missed it, maybe you can get uh, the drawing from your friend. I'm gonna develop it a bit more. The dreamer is moving from the dream you have when you're sleeping into the speech you have about the dream in waking life on the clinical couch. That's what this arrow represents, this diagonal arrow. In the Freudian conception, um, there's a, there's a, there's obstacles in waking life. Language is an obstacle. So you move back into the dream from the couch. Um, so as you're speaking about the dream, can, again, can you see this? As you're speaking about the dream here on the couch, the goal is to move up this arrow to the space where there's less repression so you can say more about the dream. You're not as guarded about the dream. So you speak, there's a lot of repression. As you speak and interpret in analysis, you move up to a space where there's hardly any repression. Um, even if you just get a couple things from what I'm saying, I'd be cool with that because <laughs> I understand it's tough. Um, so you move from sleeping to being woke from a space with less repression, which is the sleeping dream, the dream in the sleeping state, to a space with more repression where you have a waking narrative that you tell to your analyst about the dream. And then there's more repression in this moment when you're speaking about the dream because you're forced to speak about it in language, which is an obstacle. All of this, I think, is implied in Freud's theory. It's not directly written, it's implied. Um, so this speech of the dream, what is it called? Freud called it the manifest content, manifest content. You could write manifest content at the bottom right of your chart if you want, where the plus is. It's a manifest content. content. It's, the, uh, it's the uninterpreted content, the things you 
say about the dream that are not interpreted yet. On the other hand, you have what Freud called the latent content, L-A-T-E-N-T. It seems to occur in two places for Freud. It seems to precede anything we say about the dream, as if like the latent content is the dream itself, untouched by words. He does, Freud admits that sometimes. It's as if the dream and its raw reality is the latent content that we just have to unearth it, dig, dig in to it. But increasingly, and I think much more frequently, Freud claims that the latent content is buried within the manifest content and needs to be dug out through the work of interpretation. What that means is that when you speak about the dream, there's something hidden in what you say about the dream that is the truth of the dream. That's increasingly Freud's position. The latent content is a subset of the manifest content. You say something about the dream, it's the manifest content. It's not the truth of the dream. You have to interpret the manifest content, dig into it, and then you get the latent content, which is the, let's call it the truth of the dream. So we have these two terms, manifest and latent content. The latent content, or what Freud also called the dream thoughts, it's only discovered through psychoanalytic interpretation. Without interpretation, there's no latent content. We only have access to the latent dream thoughts after we've said something about the dream to our analyst in the waking state. The manifest content, it's what we say about the dream. It can include all of our feelings about the dream, our re, uh, secondary revisions where we doubt what happened in the dream and so on. But all of that, it's a distortion of the dream work by definition. The manifest content distorts the truth of the dream. It's a distortion of what? Of the latent content that we need to get at through the work of interpretation. So the latent content is hidden, right? It's hidden in a distorted way inside of the speech that we say about the dream in waking life. The latent content, when it's revealed, it will reveal the wishes that are satisfied in the dream that we find repulsive to ourselves in waking life. We have these wishes and uh, we, we, can, we can entertain those wishes in our dreams, but not when we speak immediately about the dream. We don't wanna admit that we had certain sexual desires, for example, which is often the case that are buried inside of our dreams. The latent, the manifest content will conceal those sexual desires perhaps, or, or fears of death or something like that. It will conceal it. The latent content will reveal precisely that we had this wish, these sexual wishes or urges or whatever, the wishes that we are constantly defending against. So um, how would I plot this? I'm gonna share my screen for a moment. And you can just take note of this. This is the, 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 um, the complex version of the chart. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and give you, so if you take a quick screenshot or something and share with your friends if they didn't get it, and then I'll, um, I'll explain it a bit more. This is just a development of what I've already drawn. I've just added a whole nother section here on the right side. So if you can see my mouse basically from the word repression over to the right is what is added, but you'll see it's just an inversion of what's to the left of it. I know it's really confusing, I know. Um, again, if you just get a little piece of it, it's fine. And maybe you'll have dreams about it tonight. Okay, I'm gonna stop this. Um, so I know it looks really confusing, but I'm gonna simplify the diagram in a moment. Note that there are three times for the analysis and three times for the dreamer. The dreamer moves across what I'd call the vertical axis. You know, he sleeps. If you're looking at the chart, he's sleeping, he wakes up, he or she or they are awake. Uh, the vertical axis has to do with repression, awake, waking up, sleep. You see, there's three times for the three states for the dreamer, sleep, waking up, awake. Nothing's changed there. The dreamer can move across those, those vertical axes. Um, he, he can have more or less repression as he does, he or she does so. These are the three times, his three states of dreaming. Okay, but in analysis within the clinic, there, we add three new times that cut through this entire apparatus that the patient constructs. These are the um, um, diagonal, let's say diagonal or horizontal axes, the red. What we have first is the silence 
of the patient as he or she is dreaming. It precedes the clinic. You know, you're dreaming, so you're not saying anything to your analyst. Uh, the patient doesn't know yet how to talk about his or her dreams, so it's silent. He puts the dream into words, speech, language, but the words are empty. This is the manifest content. It's distorted. It's empty. So I call it empty speech because that's what Jacques Lacan called it. Lacan, again, he calls this empty speech. The manifest content is empty speech because it's without interpretation yet. It's without any meaning. The patient doesn't know his own desires, his own wishes. And so it's empty because the patient is alienated by his own unconscious wishes and desires, which are made manifest. Um, if there's repression in waking life, then we know that we only have the manifest content as expressed through empty speech. You know, when a person is just speaking without interpretation, there's distortion, which means that the wishes are not coming through. So it, those wishes are repressed. So um, empty speech, I'm just using as a synonym for manifest content. So the idea from all of this is just to show you again that in waking life, we're also sleeping. There's still, you know, we're, we're still having the dream, but we're sleeping in a different relation to the dream. We sleep to avoid the wishes that we had satisfied in the dream. Um, but that's time two, that's empty speech. In time three, this is the time for analytical interpretation and something different happens. That's the top, right? Uh, through the words of interpretation, according to Freud, you're able to move beyond the repression that's inherent in the manifest content, to lift it a little bit and to reveal the satisfactions of the dream the wishes or, or um, desire uh, that's expressed in a distorted form. Uh, but some of that distortion uh, can be overcome to reveal a meaning. So the latent uh, content is in time three, up where I put full speech. The latent content is full speech. It's, it exists when interpretation is made possible, full speech. I take to be synonymous with the latent content with interpretation. It's what's beyond the repression or distortion of empty speech. Full speech isn't imaginary. Um, it's, it's not the manifest content. It's symbolic. It's meaningful speech. The patient is giving meaning to his or her wishes. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a lot, isn't it? How's everybody doing? I guess in the seminar we can try and um, we can try and interpret some of this together. Um, so in waking life, you're also capable of waking up. This is this is the point. You can wake up this time from the dream of waking life. Yeah, this is a total mind f. You can wake up from the dream of waking life in order to enter into the truth of your dream, the truth of your wishes and your desires. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're returning to the dream within waking life. Look, you, you were dreaming, then you woke up, you went to your analyst, and then you talked about your dream, but you talked about the dream using speech. Through interpretation, you get into the truth of the dream in waking life. How confusing is that? This is, the, this is why the Mobius strip is so important. Because essentially what, what the analyst is doing is putting you to sleep in waking life so that you can enter the dream again, but this time to extract the truth about the dream. So you're returning to the dream within waking life. You're returning to the dream world, but from a different position, like an ant on the Mobius strip, a different position, the position of the analyst rather than the position of the person who's sleeping. You're awake, you're returning to the dream in waking life, to the truth of the dream this time, the satisfactions of the dream, to an awareness of the dream. Okay, so that leads us to our final simplified diagram, which consolidates everything that we've been saying. So all these other diagrams that I've produced, it's, this is the final version. It's the only one that matters. All these other ones don't really matter. Um, they, they bring us just to the final one, which is um, the version that just, puts this on, let's say, um, a Mobius strip. 
So we have, I'll draw it and then explain it. And hopefully there's time for that. So we have dream distortion, which you can have more or less of. Can you see that? It doesn't look like you can. Can you see it? You can? Okay, okay. So you have dream distortion, which is more or less. Yeah. Um, and we also know that we have repression, which is more or less. If you ever need a chart, this is the only one you need. <laughs> okay. And then you have the, the various states, sleep, uh, waking up, and let's call it awake and being awake, going across the sort of axis from left to right. And then you have this that you hate, but I, you know, the truth hurts, baby. Empty speech. And here you have full speech. Okay. So let me explain it. Um, this is a chart you're going to see more next class because it's a version of what Lacan uses in one of his seminars, but it's my own version having to do with the dream. So empty speech, full speech. Okay, let's see what we can say about it. Again, what we've produced here is a Mobius strip. It's a version of a Mobius strip uh, because there's a twisting. You can see the twisting by the diagonal arrows. So um, again, Mobius strip, very interesting type of surface because uh, you make a Mobius strip by taking a rectangular surface and twisting one side 180 degrees and then reattaching it. So there's a continuous surface. You can walk endlessly. You're always on the same surface, but when you stop walking, you're opposed to something that's on the opposite side of the surface. So at a given time, you're within a particular moment. Maybe you're awake, and so you're not sleeping. But if you keep walking, you can see how being awake is a lot like sleeping. So that's what we've produced. It's one surface and then we've twisted it. Um, the twist is there where we wake up. See the twist is here, which is where we wake up. If you can see we're waking up. Twist is where we wake up, yep. Um, and um, on the one side we're sleeping over here, on the other side, we're awake and the twist brings us to waking life. Or if you go from here to here, it brings us to waking up. Yes. Okay. Um, the goal of analysis is to move in this reflexive way into full speech, where while we're awake, we move back into our dream world, but with less distortion. You see less distortion down here. We don't want the empty speech where we have a lot of distortion and then we speak about it in waking life and we have a lot of repression. We wanna go from repression up to less repression where we're still awake by entering the, 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 uh, the, the dream work. Yeah, so you follow the arrows. You see, if you go this track, you gotta take the long route. You go, I'm sleeping and there's a lot of dream distortion. I'm talking about it through empty speech. There's a lot of, um, a lot of repression. And then the analyst through interpretation lifts repression in waking life. And you enter the dream again to speak in full speech, the truth of the dream with low distortion. Okay, so the, what you can see is that in full speech, the dream thoughts, the latent dream thoughts, there's less distortion. Okay, I admit that this diagram is difficult, but it's also difficult because it's true. That's the difficulty of it. And so maybe, maybe you'll be struggling with this diagram for 10 years, that's fine. Maybe you will, you will just abandon it entirely right now, that's fine too. I'm just saying what, it, what you have is, is the truth of the, of the Freudian dream interpretation in this diagram. So can we say that distortion is different from repression? They're both types of repression, but there's something different in either case. One, you're sleeping, one, you're awake. Um, Something's different. And uh, we know that because, where is everybody? Oh, there you go. Because um, Freud continuously discusses dream distortion, not as repression, but dream distortion in relation to what he calls 
condensation and displacement. You know these words, if you've checked the text, if you haven't, it's okay. These are important words, condensation and displacement. He never uses the word repression when he talks about dream distortion or condensation and displacement. Um, it doesn't imply that repression is not at work. It, it just means that somehow he's making something of a distinction between what he calls dream distortion and repression. And in the speech of the clinic, in the space of uh, analytic interpretation, there's something else, which is an attempt to move from distortion, as you see in the diagram, to repression, and then something beyond. I'm going to quote Freud. The question, this is a quote from the chapters that we're looking at, the question whether every dream can be interpreted is to be answered in the negative, which means you can't interpret every dream. One should not forget that in the work of interpretation, one is opposed by the psychic forces that are responsible for the distortion of the dream, end quote. I, I see that as justification for my diagram in a sense. So it's possible that the distortion, the repression is still operating when you're interpreting in the psychoanalytic clinic. Um, it's even what justifies our theory. Repression is still operative at the beginning. That's why there's a plus when you speak about repression. But what's repressed, and I'll try and wind it down here. What's repressed is a wish. That's what's repressed. The dream reveals these wishes a bit more because what's repressed is actually lifted a little bit when we're dreaming. But it's lifted on the condition that it's distorted, that it's censored. We have these wishes. They're able to come through in our dreams and be satisfied in our dreams, but only by being distorted. Less repression, more distortion. Less repression, more censoring of our own desires. So the distortion is what happens as what is repressed is actually revealed. So um, distortion and repression, I don't see them as synonyms. Again, I'll quote Freud, this is a longer quote. We feel justified in connecting the unpleasant character of all these dreams with the fact of dream distortion. And in concluding that these dreams are distorted and that their wish fulfillment is disguised beyond recognition, precisely because there is a strong revulsion against a will to repress the subject matter of the dream or the wish created by it. Dream distortion then proves in reality to be an act of censorship. We shall have included everything which the analysis of disagreeable dreams has brought to light if we reword our formula in the following way. The dream is the disguised fulfillment of a repressed wish. The dream is the disguised fulfillment of a repressed wish. I hope Julie's going to or uh, post this video uh, on uh, Canvas for you. This, that way you can re-listen to this. So I take a formula from this. The formula is the dream is the disguised fulfillment of a repressed wish, a censored or distorted fulfillment. So let's, let's say the formula is this from Freud, the dream that we have in, while we're sleeping is a distorted fulfillment of a repressed wish. The dream is a distorted fulfillment of a repressed wish. So the wish is the object of the dream. It's repressed. It can only be revealed uh, to the patient, the dreamer, through distortion in the dream. Repression is lifted only on the condition that the wish is distorted. In waking life, However, when you're in the clinic talking about the dream, the repression is there. And interpretation works against the distortion. Interpretation works against the distortion to reveal the latent content, which is the wish, your wishes, that we don't want to face in waking life. That civilization maybe tells us is wrong, so we tell ourselves it's wrong to feel that way. So we get to feel that way in our dream. That's the goal of analysis. The goal of analysis is to place the wish, the desire at the center, to, to coincide with our desires, to be one with them in a sense. And for Lacan, it was the motor of what he called the psychoanalyst discourse. Desire, our wishes, that's the center of our inquiry. It's not knowledge, it's not meaning, it's, it's our desires. What, what we desire must be placed at the center. Um, I hope, do I have five more minutes? I hope so. Or more. Yes, you do. Okay, good. 
because I, I mentioned condensation and displacement, but I didn't say what they were. So I feel like I should mention what they are. Um, we said that our wishes are distorted in the dreams that we have while we're sleeping, right? That's what we've been saying. And I, I mentioned condensation and displacement because among others, these are the two most important ways in which our wishes become distorted in our dreams for Freud. So we have condensation and, and um, displacement. And these are two, pro let's call them processes through which the dream is distorted. So let's say, let's call it dream distortion. And we have two, one is condensation and the other is uh, displacement. These are the two ways in which the dream distorts our wishes. What does condensation, how does condensation distort our, our, um, our dream thoughts, our, our wishes? It takes the latent content, the truth of our dream, our actual desires. Let's say there's two wishes we have in the dream and it brings them into one, which is what we say the dream was about. Okay, so we have these wishes that are distorted by taking the two wishes we had and compressing them, condensing them into one dream object. Um, I don't know, maybe I have, just to put it, make it really simple for you, maybe my wish is to fly, but I also wish that I could be um, soft and caring, which I do wish. Um, well, these are two wishes that maybe I won't face in real life. So in the dream, I have a dream that I'm a bird which is soft, but can also fly. You see, it takes both of those and it puts it into one dream object. It condenses it. And by being condensed, we can't see that the dream is actually about wanting to fly and being soft and caring. We just say, oh, the manifest content, what I say about the dream, I was a bird. Simple, it's through interpretation that we've realized that it had these two wishes. The other one is displacement, which moves in the opposite direction. It, it takes one dream, wish, and it distributes it into two places in the dream, two dream objects, right? So, um, so it takes your wish and it, it cuts it up and it scatters it. Maybe I have a wish that, <sighs> I'm just gonna think of something stupid, that I want to um, uh, grow plants. I don't know, I can't think of anything on the spot, that I wanna grow plants. So in my dream, the wish is that I want to grow plants, and this is the latent content that I can't face. The manifest content is down here in these two places. Uh, so I say in my dream that there was, um, there was a green squirrel and um, I, was, I was getting taller, right? I have these two, objects that I discussed to my analyst in the manifest content, I was getting taller. And then at another time, there was a green squirrel. The green and the growing, um, when, when condensed, which is the opposite process, when you bring them together because they're displaced could mean growing plants perhaps. So you have these, these two ways of distorting our dream thoughts. One is to take our wishes and to distribute them among two or more objects, it could be more, there could be three in displacement if you like, and same with condensation, there could be more. Uh, it's two or more um, and distribute it, that's displacement. Or um, I have a number of wishes and they're condensed into one dream object. Those are two of the most important ways in which um, the censorship or the distortion of the dream happens for Freud. And in, in being distorted in that way, they're allowed to pass. We can speak about them in waking life when we distort them like that, because then we're not facing it directly. We're not facing our, the monster that we are, which is the, the desires that we have. Um, okay, so, so the thing that we should notice before next class that I'll be teaching is the following, I would say. Remember that for Freud, reality is a space of obstacles. So it means that there's prohibitions in reality. Civilization, it, it's, it, it prohibits us. It says, no, you can't have the wishes that you have. 
No, you can't be the monster that you are or something like that. This was Freud's model. And so you get to be the monster that you are. You get to lift prohibitions in your dream world. That's Freud's position. Remember that because we're going to challenge it later. Second is that the wish, the most important thing is that the wish of the dream is distorted. Um, uh, how do I put this? So the goal of analysis, as it seems for the Freudian model, is to reveal the truth, which is a meaning that's hidden in the dream that's to be interpreted. The truth of the dream is a meaning in, in some way, a wish that can be uh, ciphered through some sort of meaning. I want to be a superhero. I want to live forever. I want to be a man. I want to be uh, this, or I want, I want lots of money, or I want to be strong. Um, there's, these are meanings that you can articulate in language. Freud believed that the latent content could be revealed as a meaningful thing through interpretation. That's the other thing that you should remember. These are two very important things because we're going to see how the contemporary period challenges that. That was psychoanalysis then. <laughs> so I'll, I'll conclude with a small provocation then, um, a quote that I found buried in a footnote in one of these chapters from Freud. And I'm, it's long, but I'm going to read it. It goes like this. I found it extraordinarily difficult to accustom my readers to the distinction between the manifest dream content and the latent dream thoughts. Over and over again, the necessity of interpreting the dream was ignored. But now, when the analysts have at least become reconciled uh, to substituting for the manifest dream its meaning as found by interpretation, Many of them are guilty of another mistake to which they adhere just as stubbornly. They look for the essence of the dream in the latent content, what I've just been saying, what I've been saying all today. Um, the dream is fundamentally nothing more than a special form of our thinking, which is made possible by the conditions of the sleeping state. It is the dream work which produces this form and it alone is the essence of dreaming the only explanation for its singularity. Um, Freud's in a small footnote challenging a lot of what he's saying. Um, he still retains here the notion that we only dream in the sleeping state, unlike Freud as we'll see, or unlike Lacan as we'll see, but he's adding that interpretation and psychoanalysis shouldn't only be about revealing the meanings that we have in our dreams. Um, I think, um, I'll stop there unless we have more time and I should keep rambling. I don't know. This is actually my first class at SAS. So I don't know how these are supposed to go. We have 10 more minutes, but maybe uh, we want to ask questions. So okay. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question about presentation. Uh, what does it imply? What, the, what are we supposed to do? We will have time to discuss it um, during the seminar, but basically uh, you have information in the syllabus and I will check it once again. But uh, I also posted already the link uh, to Google Doc where, which you can fill in. The thing that I didn't mention there yet is that sources are, we can negotiate sources, but sources are probably, so it's not necessarily the source um, that is indicated for this week but the sources has to coincide with the topic of the week right so you can ask uh, Dwayne or me uh, to give you some extra literature to read and uh, you can present on it does anyone know what's the uh, how long presentation has to last it's in a syllabus what five minutes <laughs> 15 minutes 15 minutes Whatever uh, syllabus says, listen to the syllabus. So you're basically presenting uh, something that you are reading for this week or some other sources that you are permission to present. And it's not, it's not necessary supposed to be, it's not necessary for you to fully comprehend those sources, just it's your attempt to understand them. And then we will discuss them further and help each other to understand them better. Does anyone ask questions for Dwayne about his amazing lecture? 
uh, I have a question in regard with uh, latent content. So if to put in other words, <clears throat> latent content is an interpretation of dreams. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. You, latent content is like the interpretation of the dream because there's no other way to get to the latent content, it seems, for Freud. So fantastic question. Uh, great formulation. That, um, to put it really simply, latent content is the truth of the dream as a meaning that is revealed through psychoanalytic interpretation. Or what you said, which is the same thing. I've just added a few more words. It's the same thing. Latent content is the interpretation of the dream. Uh, I, I would only add one cautionary thing. Uh, uh, Maria, is that right? Yes. Maria? <laughs> nice to meet you, Maria. Um, uh, which is that uh, the dream, um, Freud does at times seem to imply that the latent content is there before the interpretation. He seems to kind of slowly abandon that and stop saying it though, which leads me to conclude that he dropped that hypothesis, which means that the latent content isn't there before, which means that the latent content isn't there before you give the manifest content. The latent content is produced as the truth of what you say in the manifest content. So you can imagine it as sort of like um, the, the, the manifest content is like, you know, there's this old thing I used to do when I was a kid. It, it was like all these red scribbles and then you put on red glasses and you can see the meaning that's hidden behind the scribbles. You know, like these 3D sort of glasses. Do, do they still have those in Russia? Anybody yes, know? yes. Yeah, it's like that, you know, the, so interpretation are these glasses that will decipher the scrambles and then you see the words that's, that's hidden behind them. Um, but you don't get to those words without the, the psychoanalytic uh, deciphering glasses, your spy glasses. Thank you a lot. Uh, thanks. Um, how did you put that, that uh, phrase though? You said latent content is interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just as happy with that answer. I think that's that's more succinct than mine, uh, but that's that's basically it. Yeah. I would add also, sorry, that it's the truth of the dream. The manifest content is not the truth of the dream. It's simply the telling of the dream, and it's often um, the the censoring of the dream, the distorting of the dream. Another way to think about it, if you like, is to think that um, the, the manifest content is what we say about the dream. The latent content is what we didn't know we were already saying about the dream. That'll confuse you even more, but that's maybe another way to think about it. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Although I don't have the privilege of asking questions, but we'll have time to discuss it more. So I wanted to ask before I'll forget, so according to Althusser, ideology is asleep, right? And who, who, who is Althusser for, for Lacan? Is the certain one, right? So is he the opposite? Is he the one who is asleep? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, Lacan and Althusser were friends, you know? And Althusser, for those of you who know him, he tried to make Lacan a Marxist by taking a sort of small elements of his theory and producing his own sort of, let's call it more of a simple theory. Lacan's complicated. If you've listened to my lecture today, you know that this stuff is extremely complicated. But don't be fooled. Because it's complicated doesn't mean that you can understand it. You know, the goal isn't to understand it. It's to produce effects, which is different than understanding. But for Althusser, um, uh, you know, he was he was trying to take Lacan's ideas and make them uh, politically relevant, and that's my basic understanding. This idea, for example, that Freud had. Freud said the unconscious is timeless. You know, the unconscious is timeless, which means that um, there's no time in which you don't have an unconscious. Althusser said the same thing about ideology. And what's interesting is you have the same Mobius structure in Althusser's conception of ideology. Those of you who are not familiar with it, it's okay. You will be before you finish your time at School of Advanced Studies, guaranteed. Uh, but Althusser's concept of ideology, to give you a sneak peek, is that um, everybody's always in ideology, kind of like how for Lacan, we are always in the dream state in dreaming, sorry, not the dream state. There's a continuity to ideology, just as there's a continuity to the dream. So this is a homology, a similarity. 
There's another for, uh, for Althusser. Althusser said, well, how do you get outside of ideology? Here's the fascinating part from Althusser. The way to get outside of ideology is to first admit that you are inside. So to get out, you have to go further in. That's a Mobius strip. You have to wake up by digging deeper into the dream of ideology. So Althusser said, for example, a person is ideological, especially when they claim they are not. You know, like um, you might have a friend, for example, who says, I always, I always tell the truth, which means I'm not ideological. I'll always tell you the truth. Pay attention. This isn't a good friend. I, I guarantee you this, this friend, don't, don't stop talking to your friends. But if a friend says, I, I always tell the truth, he's, he's by definition lying, which means ideological. Because it's impossible to always tell the truth. It's impossible. Now, if your friend tells you, I'm always going to lie to you, hold on to that friend. Because you can trust him or her or them. You can trust that statement because it's more likely that they will always lie than it is that they will always tell the truth. And it's the same with ideology. If you want out of ideology, you want to know if somebody's not ideological, you say, for example, um, I am ideological. You know, like, I'm not going to tell you I'm not. The definition of ideology is that it doesn't proclaim itself to be ideological. That's how this starts with. So you get out by claiming that you're in. In the same way, remember with the dream work, um, the way you wake up from the dream that you have while you're awake is to go back into the dream world. It's uh, both, the, both of them were obsessed with this this Mobius strip and the twisting of structure, which means the way in which we are asleep when we think we're awake and we're awake when we think we're asleep, or the way in which we are ideological precisely when we claim not to be, and we are not ideological precisely when we preface our discussion by claiming that we are. So have you noticed, for example, uh, this is, we have half a minute or something. Have you noticed that Fox News, which is a big American news channel, they have a thing called the no spin zone where they claim they're only telling the truth. What's really funny about it is the fact that everybody knows that it's the one news network that lies the most. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the, the structure of, of, of uh, ideology just as it's the structure of the dream. Althusser wanted to wake up and I think he was very woke. You know, Althusser was psychotic. He killed his wife, he strangled her. He was totally awake. Um, and maybe I'll explain what that means in another class. <laughs> he strangled her. Yeah, thanks, Julie. So we need to let you go. Thank you for participating in the class. And I'll see you, uh, I'll see, we'll see you on Friday, right, for a seminar. Yeah, it's going to be simple, guys. We're just going to talk about our dreams, I think, if, if that's okay, Julie. Yeah, okay. get your pillows. Okay. Bring pillows. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.